the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord, who is and was and is to come, the Almighty. of a great multitude in heaven saying, Hallelujah, salvation and glory and honor and power belong to the Lord our God. Yes, yes. 
is, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. All right, guys, good morning. Brother John will not be with us today. I got a call early this morning from Miss Linda, and he's down with a stomach bug, which is always lovely. And uh, so y'all pray for him. I know you can feel like you're dying when, you, uh, when you're sick like that. Hopefully it'll be short-lived, and he won't have to deal with that uh, too long, um, but Brother John's going to be out today at least, so he asked me to fill in, and I'm grateful to be able to to do that and be with you. I hope everybody had a wonderful Thanksgiving, um, got to spend some good time with your family, and uh, hopefully didn't do overdo it with the food, which is always easy to do, but... Um, it was uh, it was a good week for me. I had my I had a birthday on Wednesday. My birthday always falls somewhere around Thanksgiving, so it's it's always my favorite time of the year. And obviously, just to get to spend that time with family is is always great. So we had a great week and um, got to see everybody, and uh, so it's always good to to have that time. And we do have so much to be thankful for, do we not? Amen. So I want to I want to jump into First Peter chapter 5 this morning. Um, in our journey class, every Sunday for, I don't know, several months, we've been walking through the book of First Peter, and uh, I'm just going to pick up where we left off and, and, uh, from, from last time, and, and we are nearing the end of the first letter that Peter writes to the, um, the diaspora, or the scattering of the, of the house of Israel that is scattered to the nations, and Peter's writing this letter to um, encourage them to remain strong in the faith uh, through uh, persecution and um, uh, obviously to remind them of who they are in Messiah. And so as we near the end of 1 Peter chapter 5, uh, excuse me, of the, of the, the letter of 1 Peter, we get into chapter 5. And, and I'm going to pick up in verse 6 this morning and we'll probably just finish the chapter together. So if you have a copy of the word, let's uh, let's read 1 Peter 5. I'm going to begin in verse 6, and I'll read through verse 11. Peter writes, he says, Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you, casting all of your anxieties upon him, Because he cares for you. Be sober minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of sufferings are being experienced, are being experienced by your brothers throughout the world. And after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, 
will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. To him be the dominion forever and ever. Amen. So let's, let's pick up in verse 6 and we'll, we'll work through this passage together. And, and as we begin, we, we think about first, obviously, Peter is, is teaching us about the importance, the, really the necessity of humility. Humility. Yeah, have you ever heard anybody to, tell you that they were humble? That's the first sign that they're what? Probably not. Humility is one of those interesting almost mysterious things that, you know, you, you don't necessarily need or have to tell anybody that you're humble, but other people see the humility in you through the way that you treat others and the way that you serve and, and, and in through, through your actions, ultimately. But humility is the, I mean, if I'm thinking of the characteristics of Christ, He is humble. He is the most humble. And we're so proud. We, we struggle with pride. And, and one of the things that I've had, to learn, I've had to learn over the years is that pride does not always manifest itself in the ways that we think it does. Sometimes when we think about a prideful person or an arrogant person, we think about the loud, the haughty, the person, look at me, I'm better than everybody else, I'm going to make you feel smaller than me. Um, you know, that kind of a person, very argumentative or just refuses to ever admit that they're wrong or, or whatever it may be. And it's easy to point out those people and we can see, and, I, and I've seen that, that characteristic in my life, unfortunately, that that pride has reared itself in one of the, my biggest struggles in my life. And, and I've had to, to, by the grace of God, allow God to, to try to work that out of me. And he's still in the process of doing that. It's, it's not perfected yet, I, um, uh, to, to be totally honest with you. But the thing that we have to be careful with is that just because someone is a very quiet person or a very reserved person or what would seem to be a very insecure person, does that mean that they're not struggling with pride? It does not. You see, in my experience and what I've seen throughout life and different personality types is actually the people who are the most insecure are oftentimes the most what? prideful. And you say, well, I thought, you know, prideful people were like overly confident, but that's not always the way that it works. And so we have to be careful because pride slips up on us and it can manifest in our life in so many different ways. So just because you're somebody that can keep your cool or remain calm and, um, you know, under, uh, under pressure or whatever it may be that you don't lose your temper and those kind of things, that doesn't necessarily mean that you're a humble person. Humility is something that, that is, that is in, in us through the Spirit, through our relationship and our walk with Christ. And if you see what Peter is saying right here, he's saying, humble yourselves. Humble yourselves. So, so obviously there's a, a, an imperative here. He's, he's commanding us to do something, and God would never command us to do something that we what? That we can't do. So how do we humble ourselves? And, and, and you guys probably know as much as I do, in my experience and in my life, is that in the, in the seasons of my life when I refuse to humble myself, and if I am a child of God, God will do what? He will humble you. Amen. He will do it for you. And which way is typically easier if we humble ourselves? Typically, when we come to that realization and we repent of our pride and, and we are able to see that we're, we're acting, you know, self-righteous or prideful or defensive or uh, trying to justify things in our life or whatever that may be, that if we can recognize that before God has to humble us, it's going to go a lot better for us to just humble ourselves. And Peter's trying to remind us today how important it is. And if you say, well, how do I do that? Well, look at, look at what Peter says. Humble yourselves, therefore, under, under, that's a key word, under the what? The mighty hand of God. What is humility ultimately? Humility is a proper perspective. It is, it is seeing ourselves properly in view of who? Of who God is. If we are able to see ourselves in light of who He is, the truth about who He is as the great I am, the King of glory, 
the Lord of righteousness, our Redeemer, our, Redeemer, our Savior, our, um, you know, our, our sovereign King. If, we, if we're able to see ourselves in light of Him, just by close proximity to God. When we, and that's what Peter go, he says in the very next verse. Well, he, doesn't, he says, cast all our anxieties upon him because he cares for us. And, and earlier in the book of James, we see that James says, draw what? Draw near to God, and he will draw near to us. So it's that drawing near to God that just in that when we become nearer and we draw closer to God in that, in that proximity to the Holy One, then we are able to see ourselves for who we truly are. And I think about humility as being something uh, of a position. It's how our posture or our position, our attitude is about ourselves and ultimately about God. So we remain humble as long as we remain what? Under. Under that covering, that protection, that provision of God. But the minute that we step outside of that provision and that protection, what are we acknowledging or what are we essentially declaring before God? We're saying, God, I don't need you anymore. I'm going to do this on my own. I can handle this. And that is the epitome of pride. Dependency upon God, remaining under his protection, under his leadership, under his covering, that is the epitome of humility. And all of us step outside of that from time to time. We're, we're prone. We're going to sing a song this morning, Come Thou Fount, right? Come Thou Fount of Many Blessings. And one of my favorite lines in all of the ancient hymns that we sing, it's on my wall in my office. It says this, we are prone to what? Prone to wonder. Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. No matter how long you've been walking with the Lord, no matter how long you've been in relationship with Christ, we still have this tendency to be self-reliant and independent and to step outside of that protective covering, that mighty hand of God that is always there to cover us and sustain us and help us in our time of need. But when we step outside of that covering, at that point, God is saying, you're on your what? You're on your own. Now, I have a safe place for you. I want you to come back and, and be restored to me. But if you're going to step outside of my protection, break fellowship with me, go out on your own, be self-reliant, be defiant, be independent, then go ahead. He, God's not going to force us, right? He's going to allow us to do that. And that's when the life lessons, the lessons, the hard lessons of life, unfortunately, will humble us. Now, we can humble ourselves, but when we step outside that covering, that mighty hand of God, that is, in my experience, when God allowed the circumstances of life to do what? To humble me. And some of us have to learn the hard way. And some of us have to fall flat on our faces, sometimes multiple times, before we get the lesson and come back under his protective hand. Now, Living a humble life in this world is not always glorious. It's not always, um, you don't always get the recognition. Some people may perceive you to be weak, whatever that may be. But remember what God promises. He says, if you humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, he will do what in its proper time? He will lift you up. He will exalt you. Like many of the promises of God, that may not always happen in this life. This is that tension that we feel with being kingdom citizens. When we, when we understand who we are in Christ, we're adopted into the family of God. We're brought into this commonwealth we call Israel. We're, part, we're now citizens of the kingdom, right? And that tension that we feel is that the kingdom of God, in one sense, has already come because Christ has come, and he gives us the Holy Spirit and we are adopted into his family. And so, yes, we are essentially kingdom citizens. So already it has come in a sense partially, but it is not yet. It has not yet been culminated or fulfilled. And that's we, we live in that weird in-between right now. So when is, going, when is God going to exalt you? It may not happen before your peers. It may not happen in this life according to the standards of the world. You may not be glorified and exalted before men. You might. And there are many occasions when sometimes God does use that for his glory 
in this life and in this world. But it's not guaranteed. That's what I want to share with you. But there is a guarantee that we will be exalted and we will be rewarded for our humility. When will that happen? When the kingdom comes. When the kingdom comes. And we're going to get, more, get into more of that here in just a moment. And so Peter is reminding us of the importance of humility. He's reminding us of the importance of God's concern for you. God, God is concerned for you. How many of you struggle with anxiety? Worry. Bunch of liars out there. All of us worry. Some of us worry more than others. Sometimes we find ourselves remaining strong in our faith and going to the Lord and resting in his provision and trusting him in our time of need. And and I've done well at that sometimes and many times I've not done well at that. And he has to remind us today that we, we, are to, we are to cast our anxieties, our burdens. It reminds me of the words of Jesus, right, in Matthew chapter 11. Come to me. What did he tell us? Come to me, all of you who are what? Weary, burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon me and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart. And you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy, my burden is light. That's what God is reminding us, what Peter's reminding us here. And so he's saying that he, he cares for you. He's concerned about you. God is concerned about every little detail of your life. I'm totally convinced of that. There's no prayer too small or too big for God. Um, I can remember my dad taught me a valuable lesson. Um, you know, I can, this is one of those little things that stands out in, in my childhood, but you know, we lost my mom's car keys one time, you know, and we were having to go somewhere. It's kind of a frantic moment. You've probably all been there running around the house. Where are the car keys? Where are the car keys? My dad stopped. What did he do? He prayed about it. Lord, help us find these car keys. You know, how many times do we just stop? This is the most, the, what we would think a very insignificant prayer. Does God really care about you losing your car keys? Yeah. He does. Guess what happened about 30 seconds later? Found the car keys. So, but we take those kind of things for granted. But God is concerned. He cares about the very small things, the very little stresses of life. But he also also obviously cares about the big things that bring us to our knees, the big prayers that we have, the big struggles that we face. He cares about all of it. And Peter's reminding us about that today. Now, go to verse 8. Again, these are all imperatives. You understand what an imperative is. It's it's a command. This is written in a tense of like, this is what you are to do. He says, be sober-minded. Be sober-minded. Let me ask us. Are we really sober-minded in today's world? Now, we automatically assume sobriety with being the opposite of being under the what? The influence. And obviously there is an implication there. When we give ourselves over to wine or strong drink or drugs or any kind of um, any kind of outside substance that intoxicates us or alters our mind in any way, that is a sin. And we all know where that line is. And if, we've, if we cross that line and we give ourselves over and we alter our minds or we, we turn to substances or obviously abuse substances, that is sin. And, and, and we're not in a sober state of mind. But, you know, in our day and age, there's something else that I think is, is really um, making it difficult for believers to remain sober-minded. And I'm just going to kind of... Uh, quantify it or generalize it in this way. We are distracted. We are distracted by everything under the sun. Everything. Um, Technology being the culprit, one of the the main culprits, this double-edged sword of technology that we love it so much, but man, I hate it so much. But man, technology will distract us 
is probably the number one pro, uh, primary distractor in our world today. And so if we're giving our minds over constantly to outside forces or outside influences such as smartphones and televisions and um, internets and computers and uh, advertisements and whatever it may be, you fill in the blank, but those things also will affect our ability to be what? Sober-minded, clear-headed. And so it's not necessarily just drugs and alcohol and those things, but, but there's a reason why Peter is telling us to remain sober. He says we need to b- remain sober so that we can be what? Watchful, vigilant, to be watchers. So now he gets into kind of the battle-type language, war-type language, the same thing that Paul talks about in Ephesians chapter 6, by taking up the what? The full armor of God. Why would, why would Peter and why would Paul be, be talking to believers in terms of battle? Because there is a spiritual war, ongoing spiritual battle. And if we're not being watchful, and we're not, first of all, if we're not sober, we're not going to be watchful. And if we're, go, if we're not going to be watchful, we're going to be very vulnerable. Very vulnerable. Because Peter reminds us who our adversary is, who the enemy is. There is a kingdom of darkness. There is an army of demons. There is a, an adversary named the devil. The, 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 the word adversary literally is the Satan. Satan means adversary. This says, be sober-minded, be watchful, because your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a what? Like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Now I'm going to read something to you in Revelation chapter 20. Listen to what it says in the book of Revelation. It says, I saw an angel coming down from heaven holding in his hand the key to the bottomless pit, a great chain, and he seized the dragon, right, the devil, and that ancient serpent who is the devil and Satan and bound him for a thousand years and threw him into the pit and shut it and sealed it over him so that he may not deceive the nations any longer until the thousand years were ended and that he must be and after that he must be released for a short while now there are many there are some people in the faith that believe and and I'll give you some some terms here that you may or not may not care about but there are some in the in the faith that that are called post millennial post millennialist i know that's a mouthful but what does that mean it means that they believe that we are in this thousand-year period of Christ's reign and rule on the earth right now. And that the church, the responsibility of God's people, the church, is to change the world to such a great extent to transform the culture, to transform the, the nations, to transform the world, to transform this entire world to such a great extent that it reflects the kingdom of God that Christ will come to claim that kingdom. And part of their belief system, the reason I'm telling you this, is that part of a post-millennial belief system is that they would believe or they would assert that Satan the devil has been bound and chained in the bottomless pit right now. He's no longer active. I'm serious. and There's some very smart theologians that believe this. I can't get past that one. Because Peter here is telling us that we should be watchful and we should be sober. Why? Because our adversary, the devil, is right now at present doing what? He's still roaming. He still has some freedom, autonomy to roam around this realm. And I don't know how all the mechanics work about his place in heaven or his place in the underworld, but we know he still has influence. He's still deceiving the nations. He's still leading people into temptation to sin. He's still most definitely at work in this world. And he is looking for somebody to devour. And I hate to break it to you, believer, if you're a believer, you are a marked man. Satan does not care. He is not concerned about those who are lost. Those who are already living in rebellion, why would he waste any time on them? He has them right where he wants them. So where is he going to direct his energy and his efforts? Where is he going to direct that? Toward who? Toward God's people. 
Because he wants to devour us. He wants to catch us in a moment of vulnerability where we're not being watchful, where we're not being sober-minded, where we're walking around aimlessly, or maybe we get outside of that hand of God. Remember that protection that we are offered by God? Well, we walk outside of that and we kind of wander away from the flock. The devil is always there waiting to devour. And he, and what is his MO? He seeks to what? Steal, kill, and destroy. That's all, he, that's all he wants to do. He wants to kill, steal, and destroy. He wants to do as much damage as he possibly can to God's people. So Peter is reminding us how important it, uh, it is for us to stand against the enemy. Look at what he says in verse 9. Resist him. Resist him. Hmm. When I think about how do we resist the devil, I think there's two primary weapons we've been given. Now, the devil is a more intelligent, a more powerful being than any of us could ever possibly imagine. I don't, I don't pretend to go around and just command the devil to do whatever he, he's supposed to do, and I can tell him to do this and tell him to do that. You see, because I'm really nobody. And if I try to take him one-on-one, I'm going to lose every time. But we have been given something. I'm going to say three things. The first thing that we have been given is that as God's children and that we are in Christ, we have been given the name that is what? Above all names. That at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow, every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. That includes the devil himself. So it is the name of Yeshua, the name of Jesus that has power Because he is the king of kings. He is the Lord of lords. And so there is power in the name of Jesus. Don't forget that. So it's not us that's doing anything, but it's who? Christ in us. It's the power of Jesus in and through us. That we we belong to him. We represent him as his children. He is the one that has power over Satan, over sin, and over the devil. But we also have two other weapons that God has given us. He's given us the word. It's called the sword of the what? Sword of the Spirit. So how do we resist the devil with the Word? Yeah, prayer is the other one, so I'll go ahead. So we have prayer, which is one of our weapons. We resist the devil through prayer. And we resist the devil through the spoken Word. The spoken Word. There is power when we speak the truth of God out loud. Out loud. Manifesting the Word of God out loud because do you know how the devil knows what your vulnerabilities are he watches you he observes you and he what he listens you he listens to what you say he's a very good observer he knows where your weaknesses are he knows what your vulnerabilities are because he listens to what you say out loud i don't think the devil can read your mind i don't believe he's omniscient But we give him enough information just by the way that we live our lives, the things that we say, the things that we do, where he's a very good observer and he knows what our profile is. And that's how he's going to attack us. But the way that we stand against him and resist him is that we proclaim the truth of God's word out loud. He runs from that. Where do we see this example? Who did this better than anybody? Of course, the Lord Jesus went into the wilderness three times was what? Tempted by the devil three times, what did he do? He quoted scripture. He's quoting the scriptures. That's how he resisted the devil. Now, if you don't know the scripture, it's going to be hard for you in that moment to be able to quote the scripture. So I encourage you to study the scripture, hide the scripture in your heart, and do your best to memorize the scripture. You need to put the word in your what? In your heart. Because the devil's never going to, you know, very rarely does he attack you at the time when you have your Bible open and you're able to actually read the Scripture. Most of the time it's in your most vulnerable state when you don't have the Word of God at at hand and you need to be able to draw it from where? Draw it straight from your heart at that moment. Saying it out loud, quoting the Word of God, he flees from that. He has no power over that, over the name of Jesus, through our prayers, and through the Word of God, through the Word of God. So let's finish here in verse 10. It says, it says, so he says, resist the devil, stay firm in your faith, knowing that the same kind of sufferings are being experienced by your brothers and sisters throughout the world. 
So Peter is talking about this, this universal brotherhood of faith. We have brothers and sisters all over the world. And what is really one of the most common characteristics of a believer? One of the most common characteristics of a believer is that we will be persecuted and we will suffer for whose sake? For Christ's sake. Now, here in the United States of America, we're a little bit of an anomaly where we've enjoyed religious liberty and freedom unlike any other nation maybe in the history of the world where we haven't had to suffer the persecution that most believers have to suffer all over the world even to this day. So it's a little bit foreign to us to have to be persecuted and have to suffer for the sake of Christ. But we are beginning to see that what? It's, it's changing now in our culture. It, it is definitely changing. It's becoming more and more difficult to live out your faith before other people in this world and in this culture and in this nation. And the persecution is coming with that. And so we understand that there are brothers and sisters all over the world who are suffering and we, we want to pray for them. We want to think about them. We want to th um, uh, lift them up and consider them, even though we may not be enduring the very same kind of suffering, and, but at the same time preparing ourselves for that which is coming. And look at what it says in verse 10. I'll finish here. It says, And after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, he will himself restore Confirm, strengthen, and establish you. To him be the dominion forever and ever. So once again, we have, to, we have to wrestle with that tension. Is that we may not be fully restored and confirmed and strengthened and established in this life. We may not realize the fullness of that. But where is the promise? The promise is in not necessarily in this life, but in the life to come. In the kingdom of God, when Christ returns, you see, that is when we will get our rewards. That's when we will get rewarded for our faithfulness, our service to Christ. So it's not always guaranteed that we're going to be restored and confirmed and strengthened and established. Even though we may be partially or there may be times when we are, but it's not going to be the fullness of what we are wanting and needing and expecting. Only that will come at the return of our king when he establishes his kingdom, when he has crushed the enemy under his foot, when he has finally put an end to all evil, when he's eliminated sin and suffering and sickness and evil and the devil and all of the forces of evil, when he, when he crushes the enemy once and for all and he establishes his kingdom, that is when we will get our reward. And that's when he will fully restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish it, you and me. And so we hold on to that promise. We hold on to that promise today. So my encouragement to you guys is before we pray is, number one, humble yourselves. Number two, remember God cares for you. He's concerned about the big and the small. Number three, we resist the devil. We have to, we have to remain sober and be watchful. We need to engage in this spiritual battle. We're in a battle, whether you know it or not. You're in a battle. You're marked. You're targeted. Don't let your guard down. I'm speaking to myself as well. And that we stand firm knowing that God has promised to restore and strengthen and confirm us and establish us in the kingdom to come. Whether we ever receive that now or not, it doesn't really matter. What matters is what we will receive on that day when he comes. That's what matters most. So I want to pray for us, guys, before we, um, before we dismiss. Heavenly Father, thank you for this word today. Thank you for the reminder that you care for us, that you are concerned about us. Every detail of our life, Lord, does not go unnoticed, and you are there. You are our Heavenly Father. We are your children. So, Lord, help us. If we have strayed away, if we've wandered away from you, Lord, I pray that you would bring us back, that we would make the effort to repent, to turn 
to come back underneath that protective covering under the mighty hand of God, that we would understand, Lord, that there is no greater place to be than to be under your hand in your presence, restored unto you, Lord, where you will protect us and lead us and help us to stand and resist the enemy. And Lord, keep us sober-minded and vigilant and watchful, for we do have an enemy who is seeking vulnerability, seeking someone who can he can devour, seeking that opportune time to, to steal, kill, and destroy what is near and dear to us, Lord. And I just thank you for the hope and the promise that we have, that even though we may suffer a little while, that you have promised, Lord, to make it all right, to make all things new, and to once and for all establish and restore us to yourself in the kingdom when Christ returns. And until that day, Lord, we walk by faith. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. God bless you guys.